It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Taya Miles to you. She is an extraordinary scholar. She holds a professorship at the University of Michigan, has authored several prize-winning histories, and recently published a novel that is receiving critical acclaim. She received her BA from Harvard, an MA from Emory University, and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. After a short stint at the University of California at Berkeley, she has been teaching at the University of Michigan and is currently the Elsa Barkley Brown Collegiate Professor. Her first book, entitled Ties That Bind, The Story of an Afro-Cherokee Family in Slavery and Freedom, was published by the University of California Press in 2005 and received multiple awards. Her book, The House on Diamond Hill, A Cherokee Plantation Story, was published in 2010 by the University of North Carolina Press and won multiple awards as well. Her productive academic work earned her a 2012, uh, in 2012 a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, better known to the public at large as a MacArthur Genius Grant. From that grant has come two additional works. One is a novel entitled Cherokee Rose, which is a fictionalized account of a real personality, an Afro Creek adolescent girl who was a star student at a Methodist boarding school in the Creek Nation of Alabama in the early 1800s. In her latest book, Tales from the Haunted South, Dark Tourism and Memories of Slavery from the Civil War Era, published last year by UNC Press, she explores the popular yet troubled phenomenon of ghost tours, frequently expounded at plantations, urban manor homes, and cemeteries throughout the South. In her talk today, she is looking at something much more real, the apparent suicide of African slaves in Dunbar Creek on St. Simons and how slave narratives, scholars, and ghost tours have treated the matter. Please welcome Dr. Taya Miles. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? OK, I will do my best to speak up. Please do me the favor of just giving me a, a hand in the back if you can't hear me, and I'll try to, to do better with that. Hello to those of you in the overflow room. I can't see you, but I'm really glad you're here. Well, I have to begin with um, a sobering comment, actually. I didn't know about Harper Lee. I see that, thank you. Um, what a loss that is. And I also learned this morning, thank you, that a dear friend of mine from graduate school passed away. It was stunning news, and uh, I'm, I'm quite saddened by it. This was someone who uh, was a scholar of race, racial formation, who very much felt that our scholarship could make a difference in the world. His name is Adrian Gaskins, and I want to dedicate this presentation to him. Uh, we've been talking a lot about death, actually, at this symposium last night. We talked about the loss of a historian who helped to birth the idea of this symposium, I'm talking about death right now, and even though it is very saddening, it's also, I think, a poignant reminder that we live with loss in this world. Our time is limited, and perhaps the most enduring thing we have is this earth. So what do we do with that knowledge and that responsibility? So you will know that Adrian is on my mind as I share my thoughts with you today about the topic, The Spirits of Dunbar Creek, Stories of Slavery in Coastal Ghost Tourism. I want to give you a bit of context for how I came to be talking about this topic with you today. Paul Presley contacted me, I think it was maybe even two years ago, this has been long in the making, this wonderful symposium, and asked if I might participate and talk about my scholarship, which focuses on slavery in the Cherokee Nation, mostly here in Georgia, and also in Indian Territory of present-day Eastern Oklahoma. And I told him the symposium sounded fascinating, but that actually, lately, I'd been going to a lot of ghost tours, and I wondered if perhaps I could talk about ghost tourism at the symposium. I thought he might say, you've gone mad. 
But instead, he said, that sounds really interesting. And I was able to accept the invitation and to work through some material that I collected while attending several ghost tours in a new way. I'll come back around in the presentation to telling you more about my experiences on those tours. But let me say now that I ended up writing a book that focused on ghost tours that include and center on enslaved ghosts. And it's probably not an accident that most of these stories and tours that focus on enslaved ghosts are attached to houses. They're attached to haunted houses and homes in various parts of the South. While I was doing my research, I was hearing stories, collecting stories of uh, another kind, which had to do with a particular place, not a house, but Dunbar Creek on St. Simon's Island. This was outlier material. It didn't really fit the haunted house tour framework that I was developing. And so it sat there in a file, as much of our work does when we engage in um, years of collecting information. So now I have the chance to bring out this material about a haunted place that is not a house, about a haunted natural site, and to try to think about its potential meanings here with you. So uh, what I will be talking about today is uh, really fresh. This is my first time trying to work with this material. And I really welcome your comments and your questions at the end. I'm going to focus my talk on stories and on the cultural work that they have done and that they might do. I'm organizing the presentation around four main segments. Flying African stories and the Igbo landing uprising, dark tourism and the haunted south, the ghosts of Igbo landing, and the idea that old waters connect to old stories and might just connect to our project of trying to save the future. I'll begin by talking about those old stories. Perhaps no lore in the African American cultural canon possesses greater resonance than the story of enslaved men and women who flew back home to the continent of Africa from the coast of Georgia during the period of chattel slavery. This lore is sometimes referred to as the myth of the flying Africans, and it was handed down across generations of enslaved people and recorded by local employees of the Federal Writers Project. 23 reports of flying Africans appear in the interviews of the state-based Georgia Writers Project, which is a collection entitled Drums and Shadows published in 1940. That collection is actually available right outside the door. Now, I have to say that this compilation poses difficulties because it was constructed in the context of unequal power relations between white interviewers and formerly enslaved African Americans. The government interviewers were seeking to salvage the remnants of an exotic African past on the secluded Georgia coast where Gullah Geechee cultural formations remain strong. And so they shaped these interviews and exchanges with leading questions that were meant to elicit information about racialized folk practices, such as drumming and the fashioning of charms, and superstitious beliefs, such as visions of ghosts and witches. The narrow and indeed racist tenor of these interview scripts shaped a skewed picture of black memories of coastal slavery. We will never know what those men and women would have said if they had been asked open-ended questions by members of their own community. <laughs> Nevertheless, as is often the case when we try to do historical research on groups that have been subjugated, this is the material that we have to work with. It is material, uh, it is uh, data, these are sources that um, are clouded, that are imperfect. And so I turned to these imperfect sources to try to get a sense of the deep oral tradition of black Georgians and of African Americans more generally. Because the flying African stories, while found primarily in these Georgia records, 
have really become a major set of stories for African American cultural memory writ large. These stories have inspired Toni Morrison, the novelist Polly Marshall, the children's book writer Virginia Hamilton, the novelist and filmmaker Julie Dash, the visual artist Carrie Mae Weems, and I could go on. These fine African stories were retold by former slaves in Georgia, uh, usually two or three generations removed from slavery. And they were about oppressed black people who had been seized from their homelands and who had resisted the physical and psychological brutality of bondage. By accessing forms of magic hidden to their slaveholder captors, the protagonists of these stories flew like birds over the Atlantic Ocean back to the places of their births. One formerly enslaved man named Thomas Smith credited the original homeland, Africa, as the source of the secret flying power, citing events from the book of Exodus in the Bible as evidence that, quote, Africa was a land of magic power since the beginning of history, end quote, and asserting that this power was transportable across the Middle Passage. He said, quote, well then, the descendants of Africans have the same gift to do unnatural things. I've heard the story of the flying Africans, and I sure believe it happened. Let me pause here to tell you something that's written in a footnote in this paper, and that is that Drums and Shadows records the speech of African Americans in a dialect. And uh, this dialect, in my view, is actually disparaging to African American language. And so I have transcribed that into uh, more of a standard English rendition. I think there may be some things that have been lost in that transcription, but I'm willing to take that loss um, to not um, reproduce some of the negative aspects of those previous interviews. A religious studies scholar, Timothy Powell, has explained that these flight tales are narratives of trans transformation that reshape, quote, the hardships of slavery into the magical powers of freedom. Across the many retellings of this tale, speakers indicate that they themselves have been told the story at an earlier point in their lives, usually in childhood, often from an eyewitness who had been born in Africa. So these stories are actually evidence of a process of cultural translation between people born in Africa and people born in America. One woman said in the Georgia Writers Project interviews, quote, that all their lives, they hear about them magical things from the old folks. The flying African story is therefore evidence not only of a collective resistant spirit that relies on spirituality as well as creativity for its reenactment, but it's also evidence of a living oral tradition in which the great themes of black life, bondage, freedom, multifaceted and complex identity, and an insistence on the dignity of humanity are expressed. Among these magical flight tales, which are in actuality a suite or a set of related stories, are subtle differences indicating a textured oral tradition that took on varying emphases in the voices of multiple tellers to reflect the changing moments and changing circumstances of slavery. In their most basic form, these stories are one or two lines in length. And they attribute enslaved people born on African soil with a special ability that is sourced through spiritual power and through strength of conviction. And an example of these short renditions of the story comes from Jack Wilson, a formerly enslaved man, who said, quote, some had magic power, which came to them from way back in Africa. If they believed in this magic, they could escape and fly back to Africa. Many of the very short tellings of the flying African tale include the teller's expression that he or she believed these events to be true. So there is an interest in um, claiming veracity and truth for these stories. Now, several of the stories are more elaborated, longer than a couple of lines, and these emphasize individual flight 
on the part of an African in direct response to a situation of overwork, abuse, or psychological strain. In one example, Mose Brown reported that, quote, my grand used to tell me about folks flying back to Africa. A man and his wife were brought from Africa. When they found out they were slaves and got treated so hard, they just fretted and fretted. One day they were standing with some other slaves and all of a sudden they said, we're going back to Africa. Goodbye, goodbye. Then they flew right out of sight. End of that quote. Rosa Grant is another interviewee who told a detailed story. And this was a story passed down to her by her mother, and it was about her grandmother, whose name was Rina, and who was originally from Africa. Grant said that her mother, that is Rina's mother, Teresa, was caught too, and they were brought to this country. After they had been here a while, the mother got to where she couldn't stand it, and she wanted to go back to Africa. One day, my grand Rina was standing with her in the field. Teresa turned around so, she stretched her arms out so, and rose right up and flew back to Africa. My grand said she was standing right there when it happened. She always wished that her mother had taught her how to fly. And finally, there is a very rich account of um, the flying African tales told by Shad Hall in Drums and Shadows. And this is what Hall says, quote, those folks could fly too. Their master was fixing to tie them up and to whip them. They said, master, you ain't gonna lick me. And with that, they ran down to the river. The overseer, he sure thought he'd catch them when they got to that river. But before he could get to them, they rose up in the air and flew away. They flew right back to Africa. Now, Hall's telling in particular suggests that the river was a destination a launch pad of sorts for the Africans who had to reach that particular spot on the landscape before they took flight. This version of the tale introduces the site of a waterway as an essential element of transformation that will reappear in another account. Scholars of slavery have sometimes tied the genesis of these magical flight stories to a specific historical event in Georgia. So this is a question of where do these stories come from? Some scholars have tied them to a specific event. They suggested that these white African tales are interpretations of a historical event. Now, I found in my research that there was no clear evidence that a single happening marks the origins of this tale in the American South. However, it seemed to me that former slaves' knowledge of both the flying African stories and this particular event, a slave uprising, overlapped, so that these two different sets of stories became intertwined culturally. There may actually be even more of an overlap between these sets of stories, because according to Olivia Story, who is a post-colonial study scholar and literary scholar, quote, more vast and less knowable in oral genres, such as narratives, songs, and jokes, is a way to describe these tales. So she finds that there is more in oral culture than in written culture about these tales. The event in question, the dramatic event that some scholars have argued launched these tales, but that I am saying I don't think it launched the tales, but it interconnects with the tales. Unfolded in May of 1803, when a slave ship docked outside of Savannah after having collected souls from the west coast of Africa. Captains of the ship included members of the Igbo tribe of present-day Nigeria. And brokers working on behalf of planters John Cooper and Thomas Spalding purchased a group of these newly arrived slaves and put them on another ship called the York en route to St. Simon's Island. On the, banks, on the banks of an interior waterway, now called Dunbar Creek, the captured Ebos rebelled, <coughs> capsizing the craft. A terrified overseer, along with two sailors, died while trying to swim away. The boss then jumped off, excuse me, the Ebos, the Ebos then jumped off the ship, sinking into the waters at a place that is now called Ebo Landing. <laughs> 
And you can read about this event in, in uh, great detail in a chapter by Timothy Powell, which is included in um, the compilation that came out of the previous symposium. Uh, the compilation is called African American Life in, Life in the Georgia Low Country, and it's also available right outside these doors. So I'm pulling much of this from Powell's research. Powell shows that the assessment of this event put forward by white witnesses at the time was that the Igbos could not bear their situation and took their own lives because they were desperate. They were just giving up and they were just giving in. Roswell King, an overseer of a nearby plantation, he was a witness to the event, said that they, quote, took to the swamp and as a result, drowned. A local slave trader, William Mean, recounted this moment by saying, quote, the Negroes rose by being confined in a small vessel. The Negroes took to the marsh and they have lost at least 10 or 12, recovering them besides being subject to an expense of $10 a head for salvage. So his report is um, really focused on the numbers, what it's gonna cost to uh, get these bodies out of the water. A reflection of the view of black people as commodities. In contrast, the interpretation of this event passed down by members of the enslaved community and captured in the Georgia Writers Project contained a hint of ambiguity resulting from thematic links between the flying African <laughs> stories and this event. So Paul Singleton, a man who was born as a slave in Darien, Georgia, gave this detailed account. Quote, my daddy used to tell me all the time about folks who could fly back to Africa. They could take wing and just fly off. Lots of times he told me another story about a slave ship to be caught by a revenue boat. The slave ship slipped through Back River into Creek. There were about 50 slaves on board. The slave runners tied rocks around the slaves' necks and threw them overboard to drown. They say you can hear moaning and groaning in the creek if you go near there today. In Singleton's story, the Igbos don't enter the water of their own volition, but they are instead thrown overboard by the slave ship crew. Former slave Floyd, Floyd White narrated the Igbo landing event differently, saying, quote, heard about the Igbos landing? That's the place where they brought the Igbos over in a slave ship, and when they got there, they didn't like it, and so they all started singing, and they marched right down in the river to march back to Africa, but they weren't able to get there, they drowned. Now, neither Floyd White nor Paul Singleton denies the historically accurate conclusion that black deaths resulted from the docking of the slave ship at Dunbar Creek in 1803. Perhaps in keeping with the historicity of their reports, these men's accounts do not explicitly confirm the flying African lore, but they do suggest this lore, which leads to a layered effect in their rendition of these stories. So they seem very interested in telling what they can based on the facts that they know, but also in preserving the idea of flight in their version of the stories. The motion that's described in these former enslaved people's tales has been taken up by the historian Michael Gomez, who says that the marching toward the river is reminiscent of the spiritual practice of the ring shout. Paul Singleton, who says that the Igbo slaves drowned, so a, a sad and tragic ending, frames his tale with reference to the flying Africans. So he leaves it open, I think, for interpreters to have a different view of what actually happened. African diaspora study scholars have seized on this ambivalence in black accounts of the Igbo landing uprising and read into it an alternative consciousness. So while former slaves are not denying the facts of the incident, they're also thinking about it in different ways. They're not thinking about uh, the Igbos as um, being so desperate that they, that they just gave in to their deaths. Instead, they're thinking about the Igbos, Igbos as having a resistant quality to their actions. Timothy Powell writes that, quote, when the Igbo enter the water and cross beneath the Kalunga line, and he's using a Congo cosmogram to interpret this, 
They do not perish, but are transformed into ancestors who continue to take part in the flying African stories for centuries to come. Taken as a whole, the suite of flying African stories told by former slaves on the Georgia coast leave open an interpretation of the Igbo landing event, as well as other conflicts between masters and slaves, as moments that defied reason, as moments during which the oppressed could resist and through resistance be transported. <laughs> Rather than ending their lives in vain, the Igbo captives took wing and flew away in a metaphorical sense, enacting a symbolic flight redolent with the power of spiritual beliefs carried across the Middle Passage. And now we will shift from what has primarily been an, an uh, African-American sense of these tales to a completely different context, the context of dark tourism. Now, I don't think that it is surprising that tourism that focuses on ghosts and spirits has had an interest in the Igbo landing story and in the flying African tales because they're very powerful stories. And uh, this interest coincides with a rise in a practice known as dark tourism all over the country and actually all over the world. There has been a, a growing desire on the part of uh, many Americans and, and people elsewhere uh, around the globe for experiences that touch on the supernatural. And scholars of tourism studies and American studies have uh, tried to analyze that and think about that and, and uh, figure out what exactly is going on. Their consensus conclusion is that many people are experiencing what has been termed millennial anxiety, that they are feeling um, off balance, worried, anxious about all the changes that come with moving into a new century and all of the problems that we see developing around us. At the same time that people are experiencing this millennial anxiety, um, they also are moving away from traditional um, religious faith. We've heard about the growth of this category, people call the nuns, people who don't check a particular uh, religious faith or denomination um, in surveys. And yet these folks who might not identify with a certain church still have a longing for um, the metaphysical. They have a longing for um, connecting their lives to the realm of the spiritual. And some of that desire can be met by experiences that take people into places where the dead are supposed to be present and where the dead are supposed to speak. Now, this term dark tourism was coined by two British tourist scholars. And it focuses on a whole set of tourist attractions that are centered around death, suffering, disaster, and um, atrocity. And while there may have been interest in these kinds of things for a very long time, scholars have found that um, attendance at these kinds of events and the proliferation of these tourism offerings really start to cluster in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, and we're still seeing the expansion of the ghost tourism industry. One thing that is clear about this industry, as Elizabeth Becker points out in her recent book on tourism, is that it is very much centered on economic gain. That is what it is about. Becker talks about how tourism is a huge global of economic enterprise. She argues that we should think about it along the lines of big agriculture or big energy or big oil, but we tend not to think about it in that way. But she points out that one in 10 people around the world are actually employed in the tourist industry. It's a huge economic driver. And as tourism has expanded, it has needed to find, she argues, new markets. It's needed to reinvent itself. And hence, dark tourism has grown. Within a whole range of dark tourism offerings, tourism study scholars have identified ghost tours as being located on, quote, the lighter side. So ghost tours are supposed to be light, fun, and frivolous, and other kinds of dark tourism uh, locations and events such as 
a visit to uh, the Holocaust Museum in DC are still a part of dark tourism, but are viewed as more serious. This felt to me to be quite problematic because when I went on several ghost tours in the South over the course of two years, I found that it was in ghost tours rather than traditional city tours or traditional historical tours where African-American history was being addressed in ghost tours. So here we have this contradiction that ghost tours are supposed to be the lighter, frivolous, fun side of the dark tourism industry. And yet one of the most horrific moments of our nation's history was being represented within this so-called light and fun context. So within this growth of dark tourism and ghost tourism, Savannah actually has a special place. Did you know that Savannah is the most haunted city in America? <laughs> it actually is. It actually is. Uh, it was given this title, awarded this title. It's a, a one-time only title. No city will ever get it again. <laughs> in 2002, by the American Institute of Parapsychology, which is a Florida-based research center dedicated to supernatural studies. I contacted the director of that center, Dr. Andrew Nichols, and I asked him about the process, and he said that uh, Savannah won out because there were uh, more, quote, reports of haunting type activity. And uh, what that meant was that Savannah is very old. It has, as Nichols said, ancient structures. Um, it has the histories of being involved in several very serious wars, Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Um, it had slavery, and of course, it, it always dealt with yellow fever. And so there were many deaths and many stories of loss and suffering that could be told, and I will add capitalized on in Savannah. And the publication of the book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil actually spurred all of this on. <laughs> so New Orleans tries to say it's the most haunted city, um, but it doesn't actually have the title, that Savannah. So now we have places like the Sorrel Weed House, which is in the photograph, on the bottom right, that's a ghost tour bus going in front of the Sorrel Weed House, and that's the home, um, that are gaining national attention on all these various ghost hunting shows, and even a home decorating show, a home design show. Um, this is a brochure, front and back from the Sorrel Weed House. You can see the emphasis on haunting, kind of the supernatural woo-woo kind of aspect to it. And this is really what I experienced while I was attending approximately 20 ghost tours uh, between 2012 and, and 2014 in Savannah, Charleston, and Louisiana, and a little bit in Mississippi. This is a lot of what I saw, the exaggeration of these stories of slavery. Uh, the Sorrel Weed House story, I will look at the clock and I will do I have time to tell you briefly, maybe I do. Okay, Paul's saying I do. The Sorrel Weed House story centers around two women Molly and Matilda. Molly is an, ens is an enslaved, quote, girl. Uh, Matilda is her mistress. And uh, they were involved in a tragic occurrence in which the owner of Molly, Francis Sorrell, had been involved in an affair with her. And uh, Matilda found the two of them together in the slave quarters of the carriage house. After Matilda found her husband uh, with the slave girl, his mistress, Matilda rushed to the balcony of the Sorrelweed house and threw, her, threw herself down to her death. After Matilda died, Molly was murdered in the slave quarters. She was found hanging from a rope in the slave quarters. Uh, and no one really knows what happened to Molly. Um, perhaps Francis Sorrell killed her. Perhaps some of the enslaved people killed her. Uh, that question was left open the last time I took this tour. But, um, the story, as I think that you can see immediately, focuses around a relationship that is described as being consensual and even romantic, and uh, violence against women, and uh, the deaths of two women. There's much more to that story, but I won't go into my analysis of that right now. But this is a really popular attraction in Savannah. And the Sorrel Weed story and narrative captures num a number of the themes that I came across when I went to ghost tours that featured enslaved ghosts. The theme of uh, a white master 
and a black woman slave who are involved in some kind of romantic entanglement, um, themes of violence, a black women being uh, violently killed is a theme. Um, and there are also themes of dark, heathen, savage, African spiritualism that come up in these tours. Uh, Francis Sorrell is actually said to be someone who practices voodoo on the tour. So these stories, uh, in my view, really sensationalize slavery, and they make light of um, a very serious tragedy that happened to millions of black people in this country. So this is my frame, and, and this is what I had been experiencing when I went to St. Simon's Island and took a ghost tour. This shelf that you see is from a bookstore in St. Simon's, and um, the image at the top is the ghost tour that I took. And I will tell you that what I experienced there didn't really fit the mold, which is why this is the material that kind of got put to the side as I worked on the book. I took this tour, which was an evening tour. It was very dramatic. Um, he, he's the person who, who uh, took us on the tour. He was dressed just like that. Uh, he carried a lantern, and he, he told us that he's acted in um, history channel shows, and he was quite a, a dramatic storyteller. But this tour surprised me because as we wound our way along the shoreline and even into neighborhoods and, and along the dark streets, he started talking about Dunbar Creek. And he started talking about hydrology on St. Simon's Island and the depth of this creek in comparison to other kinds of waterways and about salt water and fresh water and brackish water. And I thought, is this a ghost tour or is this a science course? Um, it, was, it was really surprising. And he ended up telling the story of the events at Ebro Landing that I described previously in a way that was pretty accurate. And he ended the story by saying that the Ebro slaves, when they uh, jumped into the water as an act of resistance, chanted, quote, it is the waters that brought us and the waters that will take us away. He then said that people who live on Dunbar Creek right now in uh, these large expensive houses cannot go outside at night because of the chanting of the spirits of those slaves who rebelled. That was interesting. Um, I mean, I heard in that story an embedded class critique. He seemed to be suggesting that people who were subjugated in the past are still speaking up right now, and they're actually limiting the lives of people who are privileged in the present so who's getting the final word here? In his telling, it seemed to be the Ebos. Because that was such a surprise, I started looking out for other renditions of the Ebo landing story and ghost tours. And I found two more examples. If you have any uh, that you can share with me, I would love to know about those so that I can write those down and include those when I revise this talk for the edited collection. But the two other examples that I found were in Nancy Roberts' book, Georgia Ghosts, and Jordy Buxton's book, Haunted Plantations. Uh, now, Jordy Buxton also operates a ghost tour in Charleston. And um, he was kind enough to give me a personalized version of his tour when I went to Charleston. I didn't know what was going to come up in this tour, but it turns out that he started talking about the lost tribe of Israel. Where is this going, you wonder? I wonder the same thing. Where is the lost tribes of Israel going in the story? Well, it turns out that uh, Jordy Buxton felt, at least at that time, that the lost tribe of Israel is really the Igbo tribe. And uh, that it's this lost tribe of Israel, the Igbo tribe, who ended up on that ship coming to St. Simon's and who rebelled. So he told a story in which the quote, chief of the Igbos on that boat began a chant to uh, the West African goddess Mama Wati. This is what Jordy Buxton said. And he translated Mama Wati as being mother of waters. Um, this chant, he says, can still be heard today at St. Simon's. In his book, Haunted Plantations, he also tells a story, but 
interestingly, he leaves out the lost tribe of Israel part. Um, but he does talk in the, in the uh, printed version about how the African people who resisted in that moment were connecting to their own spirituality. So he said in the book, quote, water and the spirit world have always held special significance to many Africans. It is water that acts as the passage to the next life. And the next example that I found came from Nancy Roberts' book, Georgia Ghosts. In this book, she has a long story about Eva Landing. It's a fictionalized story, which she says she collected while she traveled around the state collecting ghost stories. I will just give you a short version of, of this story in which a young white man and a young black man come back to St. Simons. They're off away in college. They're, they're childhood friends. And they decide to go to uh, Dunbar Creek um, so that they can kind of have a thrill and a scare. And while they're there, the young white man uh, starts to notice that the wind has changed and the waters around them um, are changing. And they see, both young men see in the distance, a ghost ship. And they notice that there are people chained on the decks of the ship. And when they see this, they have a conversation about slavery in which the white young man says, it's so terrible, I feel guilty about this. And the black young man says, don't feel guilty. Um, African people sold black slaves too. Now, this version of the story, uh, in my view, uh, is not as politically conscientious as the story that I heard on St. Simon's, but it was still very interesting because it, uh, the story was being used as a framework for talking about race on St. Simon's. And um, even if they didn't end up where I might have ended up in that conversation, these two young men were talking about slavery and responsibility and race. And they were talking across the lines of racial difference. So what I found in these stories was just a really different tone than what I found in the other ghost stories that um, I've described briefly. This is an image from a haunted website. And this image is not in keeping with the ones that I showed you previously or with most of the images that you will find when you go to any of these haunted websites. Um, it's in an image that is showing restraint. There, there is a holding back here. There is, um, I think, a sense that the stories that originate from this location need to be taken seriously. So it's my sense that even in the hands of white tourism professionals, and I should say that when I went on these tours, I only saw white owners who were um, constructing these narratives and who were um, putting forward the notion that it should be fun to think about enslaved ghosts. I only saw this done um, at sites owned by white people. So I think that it's important to track who is doing this. But in this case, even white tourism professionals were seeming to hold back a little bit they were seeming to refrain from sensationalizing these stories. And I think that could be for many reasons. I think that it's partly because these stories have such a long and deep tradition. It would be a violation to um, tell these stories in a way that talked about blood and gore and that really uh, emphasized and described black suffering, which you find in many of the other tales. And I think that this is also the case because these stories are embedded in a landscape and they are um, documented in narratives that these tour guides actually really seem to have read. Some of the aspects of the stories that they told could almost be direct quotes from uh, the narratives collected in the Georgia Writers Project. So this leads me to think and to hope that the power of these stories that are based in this landscape can do something culturally that's different. It can lead people to think in different ways. It can encourage people to exercise restraint. And that brings me back to a quotation from Timothy Powell's essay that I mentioned earlier. He talks in this essay about, quote, the curative powers of storytelling. And by this phrase, he means that these stories help to heal the psychic wounds of slavery by conveying the message to all black people that the generations who suffered through bondage had within them deep reserves of strength. 
I agree with this assessment. I think that it's a beautiful assessment. And I'm adding to it that I think that tales of Igbo landing seem to be resonating, that they have a broad narrative power, a narrative power that affects not only African Americans, but also people who do not come from that cultural tradition. These stories are seeming to compel serious discussions about slavery, about race and racism, about difference, about class, about what we are choosing to do with these waterways right now, such as in the version of the St. Simon's Guide, building huge homes alongside them. So this leads me to the last thing that I want to talk about, and that is water. I think this is a little bit of a leap, but please stay with me. Two of the flying African and Igbo landing stories told by former slaves in Georgia evoke the water as a place of spiritual power that serves as uh, a fluid runway for flight or for rebellion. As Shad Hall put it, quote, they ran down to the river. The overseer, he sure thought he'd catch them when they got to the river, but before he could get to them, they rose up in the air and flew away. And it is in the account of a former slave that the first sign of haunted waters at Dunbar Creek appears. It was Paul Singleton who said about this place where the Ebos sank into the depths, quote, you can hear moaning and groaning in the creek if you go near there today. Contemporary ghost tour narratives have picked up on and highlighted this aspect of the oral, tra oral tradition, emphasizing the enabling role of the water. In the St. Simon's Island tour, the guide opened his tale by detailing the hydrology of Dunbar Creek. And Charleston, the tour guide, personified water as a living spirit. And the author, Nancy Roberts, told a story in which the waters moved in synergy with return of the Igbo spirits, rising and opening as a slave ship appears and receding when the ship disappears. Tales from the Georgia Writers Project uh, interviews as well as the present day ghost tour stories highlight a feature of the environment, water, that stands in relationship to the oppressed, that is called upon by the oppressed for aid. And it is this water that actually projects the enslaved African voices of protest into our time. Now this is the one link that I can make with my Cherokee work, Paul, um, and that is that it, it was through that reading of Cherokee history and Cherokee tales that I came across the idea that landscape holds stories, that it's features of the land that help us to recall the past. And so I think that the symbolic presence of water in both the early accounts of Igbo landing and flying Africans and these later accounts actually are relevant for us in this moment when environmental crisis looms in the form of climate change, damaged oceans, and pillaged natural resources. From the deep waters of Dunbar Creek, a deep well of stories, not only about slavery, but also about the natural world, emerge. Those stories tell us that the waterways that meander through the lives of the marginalized helped them to access powers of transformation for fighting the system of chattel bondage. And today, those same haunted waters preserve the memory of black people's creative struggle for freedom. These old Georgia tales might therefore be repurposed to further a sense of environmental consciousness and interdependence, not only among the descendants of slaves, but also among residents of and visitors to this rare place where the waters held secrets and the people had wings. Thank you so very much. Terrific. Thank you. Very moving. <clears throat> um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. As before, if you'll identify yourself and wait for the microphone to arrive before you ask the question, it'd be much appreciated. So we'll open the floor up and Ty, I'll let you call on folks. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, ma'am, in the middle right here. 
was just curious because these, um, especially the last part about Igbo landing, reminded me of some of the magic realism in Colombia, in Haiti, Brazil, mm -hmm. you name it, Cuba. Um, and I wondered if you had thought about this being our magic realism or the South's magic realism and how you were, if you ever thought of connecting those two aspects of storytelling. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that per se, but I think that if we were to look at these stories through a literary lens, we could absolutely think about that genre. Yes, sir, over here. You said earlier uh, that it, in one of the ways some of these conversations occurred, uh, people said they were going to fly away to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later your references to going into water. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if not if it, an enslaved condition. Escape in any form is what you want. And maybe the incidental thing, fly away to Africa, hop into the water, uh, incidentally, you have to go through death to do that. But it's still a form of escape. Right, right, it is. And um, one part of the paper that I didn't talk about in the interest of time was looking at the scholarship of Michael Gomez, who really thinks about the Igbo in particular and the reputation they seem to have had among Virginia planters as being people who, um, who at attempted suicide more frequently than other groups. What Gomez does is he thinks through that, um, that so-called or that represented tendency towards suicide as being part of um, a spiritual framework in which people had to go back home in order to have a proper burial and to be connected with their ancestors. This was very important for Igbo people. And so what he talks about is how suicide uh, was not viewed as giving up or giving in. It was really viewed as um, a means of transportation back to the homeland and back to the place of one's ancestors. So there are many ways that we can look at it, and, and that's part of the ambiguity that I was trying to lay out, that we can talk about suicide as, as um, being an act born of defeat, or suicide as being a transcendent act um, that really is about resistance and escape. Yes, ma'am. Pat Gunn, the Geechee Institute, and I am a master storyteller of Gullah Geechee. Oh, Welcome. Thank you. We are the ones that know the going on around here. I just wanted to commend you and your uh, 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 formation in terms of acknowledging that the tours that are being developed in this low country region are done with respect for the stories. I tell the story all the time of the legend of Igbo Landing and I personally believe it happened. Just as I believe Moses parted the Red Sea and the people went through, I see the assimilation between both stories. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'd like to just comment on that and say that I felt a, a bit of a risk here. Anna talked about the, the risk that she felt in her research yesterday of um, taking away from people the meaning of Gullah Geechee culture and of that identity. And when I started doing this research, I felt that I was uh, in a risky zone because when I went back and looked at those interviews, what I found was what I relayed to you, and that was that the Flying African Tales did not map directly onto those Igbo landing tales. And some of the, the, uh, the formerly enslaved people who told those stories, they had some skepticism about flying back to Africa. They included that, they were aware of the, the oral tradition that they thought that was important, but they weren't so sure that it happened. So it felt to me like a challenge to try to preserve the power of those stories, because I believe it to you, I have to believe it. I have to believe it. To preserve the power of those stories, but to also um, faithfully reflect what the scholarship revealed. That, that's, that's challenging to do oftentimes, because I think that we need our stories. They feed us. Thank you so much um, for, your, for your presentation. I wanted, first of all, to echo what Mike Gomez has written about in terms of the Igbo and their 
their reputation in the papers of slave traders as having a proclivity toward suicide. And I think even, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book written by the Igbo author that many American high school students read. I cannot think of it at the moment. Uh, but suicide has a certain place in Igbo culture um, and in Igbo spiritual traditions um, that, as you say, is about transcendence and about crossing the water back to one's ancestors and not a sense of, of shame and giving up as we would think about it. Something that has struck me, um, and I have not seen it really written about or dealt with, and I wondered about your thoughts, it seems to me that the literature on the transatlantic slave trade and even slavery has not dealt with suicide and mental illness. I am constantly struck as I read um, slave ship papers, diaries, ship logs, captain's papers, et cetera, at the number of enslaved people, the number of captives who took their, lo their own lives. Mm -hmm. It is astonishing um, and took their own lives in terms of drowning. I deal a lot with rice, of course, in terms of starving themselves to death. There are just so many ways. Um, and so how do, we, how do we think about these acts? Are these also transcendent? Um, what do we do with that? Oh, I appreciate that question because it's very difficult. I'm going to just shift for a moment to some of my Cherokee research because when I was exploring the records of the Chief James Van House, which is a, a state historic site up in northwest Georgia, I learned that there were slaves there that committed suicide. So. In many ways, that challenged a notion that was out there in the literature that Cherokee slavery was um, an easier kind of slavery uh, for black people to experience. So I came across that early on, and, and yet my feeling is the same as yours, that we don't see a serious kind of um, discussion of psychological damage. And I think we don't see it because we're very concerned about, we being scholars of, of African American studies and history, uh, I think that we're very concerned about representations of black people as damaged. And it's difficult, again, to uh, kind of straddle that line between recognizing the real scars that slavery left on people when they survived, if they survived, uh, and also recognizing that, but they did survive. It's difficult to keep those two things in view, and I think that we, we um, err toward the side of let's show how they survived, as opposed to let's show um, how damaged they were. But it is absolutely a part of the story. And when I was reading The Flying African Tales, I was surprised at the extent to which um, my thoughts kept going to the psychology of it. Psychology of telling these tales the pain that's encapsulated in those tales, right alongside of the idea that there is a way out. I mean, part of the predicament for African Americans, or low country Creoles, to borrow your term, part of the predicament is that they don't have this power. They don't have it. It's actually the, the African people who have the power. It is the low country Creoles, or the African Americans, people born on this land, who have to hear about the stories and, and watch people flying away. So oh, there's, a, there's, a broken, um, there's a broken link there. And that came across again and again in the stories, this feeling of she flew away, but I could not. OK. I, I, I wonder if you know, if there is no recognized memorial to the Evo landing site at the present time, and there's a great controversy going on now between a group that wants to, to create a, a memorial to the landing and a real estate development company called Sea Island Company who wants to go for it for a parking lot. Oh, my. Um, Could you repeat that question? Yes, I will repeat the question. The question was, uh, do I know about commemoration or markers at the site right now? 
and uh, that there is a conflict going on going on currently between people who want to then raid the site and preserve it and people who want to turn it into a parking lot. Uh, I am so glad that you raised that. I don't know the details of what's going on right now, but I can tell you that um, I took these pictures in 2012 and I found this um, uh, repatriation um, flyer online. So I know there is a group, uh, the Ebo Landing Project, that has already been doing things to remember the ancestors there and that wants to mark that site. But, oh my goodness, I mean, what this has reminded me of is um, the, Margaret Gar the Margaret Garner story. That's the basis of Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. Uh, Margaret Garner was a real woman who ran away from slavery in Kentucky where she had been forced to have the children of her master. She ran to Cincinnati and um, when she and her family were uh, cornered by slave catchers, she started to try to kill her children to protect them, to save them from slavery. The site where that happened is now a waste treatment plant. That's what it is. So you can't go to that place and remember that story. Um, these sites are precious. They are precious. For what they hold for us, they are containers. And I mean, I, I just hope that the people who are trying to commemorate this site prevail. And I wonder what we can do, those of us in this room and in the overflow room, and we might watch this later on, to help to strengthen that movement. I mean, it seems to me that um, that development is, um, is a bane <laughs> to the existence not only of cultural preservation, but also to the preservation of our environment and our natural spaces. Thank you very much, Ty. Wonderful. Okay, Paul's telling me that we are going to break for lunch now, and we'll start at 1.40, 70 minutes from now. Thank you. <laughs>